Okay, so concept of thinking the opposite, you know, and and the, and that actually was uh, implemented later. So if I could, uh, this is the potato peeler. If I abstract out, it is you take out the outside to get to the inside. Okay, that's what a potato peeler does. And if I, if I were to flip the idea, have you seen this? Yeah, I, I thought it was brilliant. Okay, you cut a hole, you mash up the inside, put a straw, and say, okay, here's your whole watermelon juice. Okay, now without opening the outside, you are actually getting to the inside. Uh, next strategy was if you have a hammer, find all the nails. If you have a solution, look for all the problems that can solve that. Okay, example is an app. Nowadays, you can use an app for so many different uh, kind of problems. Uh, if the if this is a solution, a solution again, uh, zoom out and see a tape dispenser, something that you can take out the material and cut with one hand. I'm, I'm just abstracting the concept of a tape dispenser. Where else can you use it? The SMD dispensers, SMD component dispensers. Okay. Uh, generally, SMD components are in uh, sachets covered with a thin layer oh, of okay. paper. So while soldering, you cannot pick it up easily. All your okay. hand are uh, sticky due to the flux and all. So, so some of these ideas already, you know, implemented, like you know, cutting out you know, hand towels and you know you have the uh, tablecloth cover in you know, the paper that they use in restaurants they just rip it out and put them you know, put them in and so many other things you can go do with it okay I'll next strategy is once you find the solution find you know once you find a problem find all the solutions to the same problem okay so example is what does a stapler do it puts paper together okay Tell me other ways to put paper together. Yeah, pin it, bind it, glue it, you know, you know, stitch it. Just, you can actually think about all kinds of ways to solve the same problem. So it is uh, once you're finding all the hammers. Okay. The last one is take a, an idea and add an adjective. So X, next X is adjective plus X. So what does Pizza Hut do? They serve pizzas. What about Domino's? Yeah, they both serve equally crappy pizzas. Okay, but what did Domino's do that made them a, such a success? They used to be mid, from Michigan. You know, it's a small little place long back. <coughs> they added the f f f ad adjective faster. Thirty minutes exactly. That built the whole company. They said thirty minutes or it's free. You know, and. Uh, we used to, I remember ordering and hoping it's late, they're, they're late, you know, because we'll get the food for free, you know, never happened. So, if I could take the concept of color pencils, okay, uh, can you put an adjective? Give me a color pencils that add additional or put in front, add some adjectives to color pencils. Color pencils that don't break. Color pencils that don't break, any others? You don't have to sharpen, okay, that's good. Smudge free, yes. Save for kids, oh, wonderful. So some of the examples, you know, have you seen this color pencil that watercolor pencil, okay? Have you seen this color pencil with multiple colors? Now the interesting thing is the person who wants to buy this is never gonna buy that because they're going for the product with that adjective already in it. Okay, so so this was his concept, but when you go through your exercise, you have to start to think in all different directions to come up with the next idea. So we're going to quickly iterate. Okay, I, I, the iteration basically is the problem is still the same. Okay, I'll give you two minutes. This time, go crazy with your ideas. Okay, starting now. Okay, so I know I'm not going to count the number of ideas that you have. Normally, in your in your class, they have to put those stickers in a post-it pad, so we know how many ideas came about. So I want to help you take take out some of the filters that we normally use. We have 
several thinking filter that we use in our ideation. And I want to start taking one by one out, OK? So I want to give you a constraint. The first kind of thinking that we have is, uh, we, first thing, we edit our thoughts before we say out, is that I don't want to look like a fool by saying something that looks really, really stupid, OK? So we kind of edit it back into the round shape. We lost all your edges, OK? So you cannot do that. So we, let's actually take out the first filter. First filter is we tell ideas that are not too expensive. You say, oh, this will be too expensive. It can't be done. So let me, let me not even suggest it, OK? So long back, you know, uh, you know, if someone told you I could pick out a, a thing from my pocket and talk to anyone in the world, you would have said, you know, it's it's not possible, okay, or it's too expensive or whatever, you know. So you would have actually would never have thought about any of these kind of ideas. So I, first thing is, whatever ideas that you come up with should cost at least a million dollars. So that means don't be a cheapskate, okay. <laughs> Come up with ideas that are so damn expensive that you can't afford it. So you you have to physically take that, you know, mentally take that that filter out of your head. Okay. So I will give you 60 seconds to come up with as many crazy ideas that are as expensive as possible. Okay. Hopefully you had some really expensive ideas. So the next filter that we normally have is that it is, will not be accepted by others, OK? So think of you know, ideas that will get you fired. If you went to your boss and said, I have this idea, and he'll say, please leave, OK? <laughs> so you know, it could be immoral, illegal. It doesn't matter. It's only an idea. Nobody's going to arrest you for that, OK? So the thing is, Come up with ideas that will get you into trouble. Take out that filter which tells you that you have to come up with ideas only that others could accept. OK, the third filter that you normally have is that it is not possible. It is not technically possible to do it today. OK. So as I said, uh, a phone today would have looked like magic 30 years back. You know, we have no idea what, what we are going to talk about as magic you know, 10 years from now. If you brought anything from 10 years ahead, it will look like magic today. So don't be limited by what is possible technically. OK? So think of. Ideas that will have magic or fantasy. It really doesn't matter how it works. You could have a you know, f uh, magic wand that will actually change things. You know? And uh, come up with ideas that is not possible today technically, but it, is, it looks like magic for tomorrow. OK, so I, you know, when, when I normally ideate with, uh, with folks, or if you're thinking about a problem you want to come up with an idea for, you start looking at things around you and see how do you connect whatever you see with the problem that you're, you know, that you're dealing with. You know, how do you abstract anything that you see? So take random thoughts. So if you're dealing with you know, a problem with schools and kids, you know, any pro anything I see, I can see shoes, I can see walking, I can see sand, I can see pottery. You know, I can see, you know, the craft. I can just, you know, take an idea and build on it and see how do you build some of these kind of things into your idea that you're looking at. Or I can see voyage, moving people, water, you know, fishing. You know, I can take from the image, I can just go at all different angles to see if, if any of them could be used. You know, art, expression, poetry. Uh, so, you know, vegetables, I can see for agriculture, farming, teaching kids through farming, you know. So you, you, so you, you, you look around and start to create ideas from whatever you see, as long as you can abstract them. So I want ideas now to take one of the ideas that is quick to implement and one of the ideas that is a breakthrough idea. Imagine if when Uber went and suggested that we are going to make people drive for each other, you know. You know, nine out of ten said no. That is not going to work. Okay, 
And that was a breakthrough idea. Maybe at that point, the technology was not there. Maybe they created all the technology. But you need to actually identify something that is so futuristic. Okay. So we won't uh, go into this. Then comes the prototyping. So that is, we are still in the, the fourth stage. Prototype, uh, you must have seen this thing, you know, uh, the spaghetti challenge. You are supposed to uh, uh, use a uh, marshmallow, some tape and, and thread and, and such, and create a tower and build as tall a tower as possible. So what inter interestingly happened is that this, is this was a study done by uh, Stanford. So they found the average height was 20 inches. And business school students, the average is about 11 inches. I'm not kidding. This is not my data. OK, so. And school kids, the average is about 28 inches. So and of course, you know, architects and engineers could make because that is a job. OK, like, you know, so. But why, why is it that the business school students versus kindergarten, there's almost a difference of times three? Okay, so when they studied, what they, what happened is that when the students were doing this, they would actually gather, think, draw, 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 whatever, do everything, and just make one prototype. And at the end of it, pff, it falls. Okay, <laughs> done. Okay, it never worked. But when school kids did it, they made one step and it failed, and they you know reinforced it, made the next step, and then they had multiple failures before they got to the point. So the, the reason you know, why I'm saying this is that you have to take it through multiple iterations. You are not going to make any of your prototype in the first stage, first step. Okay, And also the cost of failure goes up as you get closer to the ship date. Imagine uh, Samsung Note 7. Because it caught fire, you know, they had to kind of abandon the whole model. And I used to hear airplane, inside the airplane, they say, if you have Samsung Note 7, please don't bring it into the plane. What does it do for your brand? Okay, so the cost of a failure at that stage is billions of dollars. If it was caught at very early on through iteration, something you, the cost would have been so much less. So the next stage is of testing. And even when you do the testing, do not try to make your real product. You know, make you know things that look like prototypes and work like prototypes and such. And if you're making an app, don't make an app. You know, how do you make these paper uh, screens and such? And check out to see how people respond to it. And, and that is how you uh, do your five. So these are the final the five steps. So you guys are going to go on a field trip. And I think all your teams are going to go on a field, on field trip. So when you go field, on field trips, observe. See how they live, how they work, how they interact. Interview. Understand their pains and dreams. Get past the easy questions. You know, this, don't get past the easy aspirational questions. Get to the constraints. Understand the constraints. Take notes and take pictures and, and bring all those things back. Okay. Of course, ask their permission before you take pictures. After the field trip, synthesize, put in all your observations on, on, on the wall. Understand inferences and hunches and define the problem. And only then you can actually start the solution ideation. So when... Uh, when uh, I was talking to F F Sriram yesterday, he asked me, well, I mean, this morning, actually. It looks like yesterday already. You know? So he was asking me, so what do you exactly do? And I was talking about my work. And he said, you should talk to the I'm blaming you. Okay, So I thought I should actually talk about what I do f uh, f currently in my research as well as work. Question is, what's your life mission? Do you have a life mission? You know? Life mission doesn't mean I need to pass this exam. Okay, that is not. Put yourself several years ahead and see what, what impact you want to make in life. I can tell you what I want to do is to transform communities through changing kids and teaching them innovation and entrepreneurship. This is what I do in different places. So I, as part of, this is actually created from my own life. Of, uh, I've been an entrepreneur and you know, designing products for the last 30 years. So I ideas, school kids in any, I actually children, anywhere in the world have the, exactly the same ability to do all this, to be innovators and entrepreneurs. We never actually give them an exposure, opportunity to do all these kind of things. So I created this format of, you know, you take someone who has no exposure, 
teach them how to design and make things. These are the creative ones. Make the makers, let them let, teach them how to solve problems, okay? Hackers, you know, innovators, and then how do you help them launch, commercialize it, and monetize the ideas that the problems that they solve. So I run these maker programs in in. Uh, in okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think I have any control over this. Okay. So these are kids, uh, uh, the secret making robots that can form the workforce of the world. Now, 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 these are the kids. So I go teach these kids, and you should see the kind of change that you see in them. And in two days, they go through ideation, mechanical design, you know, 3D printing, electronics. They actually create systems that actually work. You know, and they actually you're, you're taking them through system level thinking, and uh, for coding and movie making and things like. That. They actually in two days they do all these kind of things. Uh, so to make impact in 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 rural parts, of course, they don't have maker labs and such. So we created this program called Zero Lab, Mini Lab, and Maker Lab. Zero Lab primarily is we go to these places, ask these kids to bring trash from home, and we teach them to make with that. Okay, this is in Jakarta and and in in Gujarat and all that. So they make instruments and you know cameras and and things like that. So understand how do you use uh, how do you apply what you learn, and then. Mini lab is interesting. So we gave them, this is actually happened in villages in Gujarat. We gave them four motors, four wheels, and DPDT switches, the double pole, double throw switches, and power adapters, and, and said, go make robots. And we're going to come back in a couple of weeks, and we're going to play football. So this is what happened. Okay, and watch the kids. Okay, game is one thing. to make a program that we run. And you know, and then they all these schools adopted that, and they started creating programs within these villages. So they started more girls started getting involved in this. Okay, and which is absolutely necessary because they can do exactly as 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 much as the boys. So then they started working with carpenters and around them to create additional pickups and and cranes and things like that. You know, so with just four motors, four wheels, and these switches. These kids have already gotten into mechanical design, you know, conceiving and thinking of ideas. And so they were playing cricket with the same four things. Okay, like you know, they were making all these kind of games. So then we created this uh, maker lab in a box. It has 3D printers and mechanical you know, tools and all, soldering stations and all kinds of electronics. And we created 10 of these things. And we went to a town in the northern end of Malaysia on the, on the border of uh, Thailand. And uh, this, uh, we al also ran it in, in, in Mysore. We took 10 schools uh, from these places, took six students and two teachers, and ran a workshop, gave them all these maker lab in a box. They took it back to their school. And they started working with it. They started teaching others. And we gave them mentorship and the final competition, you know. And so this is what happened in my in in uh, Keda, which is in in my, Malaysia. First three hours, nine o'clock in the morning, these kids got a ba box, uh, a kit of three three D printer kit. They were supposed to assemble, learn CAD, and do the first three D print. And these are thirteen and fourteen year old kids. <laughs>
So then, of course, it was a two-day program. The second day, they created all these kind of uh, interesting stuff. So this is my mission at this point. I say this mission out so that I cannot escape from it. You know, so I have to put my word where my mouth, you know, uh, money where my mouth is. So I actually keep saying it everywhere so that I cannot escape from this. I goal is to reach a million kids and create this kind of change in, in communities. Thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, for the program which you are running, uh, the program which you sh uh, showed, the students yeah. which you taught, uh, in two days, you in three hours, they, you took from their drawing stage to 3D design and 3D printing. So <clears throat> what's the uh, base quality of the students which you are targeting means? For example, if we go on th being from a background where my mother is a okay. government so teacher. So, so I these are all from uh, government schools. Most of them had not used a computer. So they first day we are telling them how to move a mouse, okay? And uh, this is not about technology at all. The idea is that from morning till evening they are taken outside their competence, what they th thought they could do, and they f should fail. And these are all control failures. So they can't do this. They kind of give up. They, they, before they give up, we kind of make them realize that they can do it, and then the next challenge comes. After a few cycles of failure and recovery, that's when they start to build resilience. They realize that I can do this. And that is when you start to build your self-efficacy or the confidence. So it has nothing to do with what their background was. You know, so yeah. If that was a question that you're asking. No, uh, not about the back. I mean, uh, 13, 14 uh, year students which you talked about. So it's roughly around six or seven standard students. Yes. So when, com uh, when we saw the quality of the students, quality in the aspect, the way they were working, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And being from the background where I have seen my mother teaching the students in schools, government schools, I saw that the students in uh, standard six or seventh were barely able to write. I'm uh, talking about the reality. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. the Indian reality. I don't know about the other sector, uh, the Gujarat reality, which I'm talking about. I don't know about other states. I don't know about other schools. So I no noticed that the students were barely able to write their names or even communicate fluently to each other in other languages. Yeah. And when it comes to designing in a software which is completely English based or software which is uh, working on high level English. Though it's even not. So, so this is, my Gujarati is not, not non-existent too. Okay, so if I, when I'm talking to them, I, this, so this is, a re, when you teach them, you have to teach them with very minimum tools so they can actually learn and, and figure out. So it is not, I don't uh, teach them, you know, coding, I don't start to talk about all the rules of language. You never learn, learn to speak with grammar. You just learn to express, okay? You can actually, and second thing is, this is not about making them master at anything. It is about breaking the, the threshold of fear getting past the threshold of fear that they can actually build that confidence. So I don't think the language has any issue here. Uh, they all know English alphabets if they had to print some, type something. So I, I don't think any of those things are as much. So I'm not going the, through the, the normal education route. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, please. Good evening, sir. I'm Tushar Kukreja. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. So my question is, uh, I have been also asking myself the why of my life. So can you share how has your journey been that you decided that empowering underprivileged children is the uh, purpose of your existence? Oh, I, I was just talking about it in the education session. No, I, I was born and brought up in a you know, lower middle class family in a village in Kerala. So for me, Things that happened in my life, I was like a wind in the, you know, leaf in the wind kind of got me to where I am. Okay. So when you look back, you realize that uh, one major impact I had in my life, which now when I look back, I realize, was exposed one electronic, you know, the radio repairman showing me what is inside a radio. Okay. It excited me. I went back and started making little things, you know, crystal radios and things like that when I was in school, uh, studied engineering, studied product design, studied mechanical engineering, you know, for, for manufacturing and 
designed hundreds of products and multi several companies and things like that. And when I, when I was doing my thesis at MIT, I said, I believe there are a billion kids in this world who could have done exactly what I've done. Okay, but they are missing the exposure, not intelligence. There's no problem with intelligence. Everyone has exactly the same intelligence. Okay, it is the exposure that makes all the difference. So how do you actually change them? So I went through my life. I said, what happened in my life over several bottles of alcohol, you know, and said, okay, this happened in my life, and I kind of gained this kind of confidence. And I went and said, I want to test these modules out in different parts. So I went into different colleges in, in, in India. And my thesis was done in different places. I said, went back and tried and tested it out. And what I found was that you had the, exactly the same change. So I created this whole system. And then I said, I realized going to college kids is a little late in their life. Not because you cannot change it, but the rate of change is going to be much higher. They have to learn a lot more, lot more in the shorter time before they can go start companies and do all these things. So I said I should actually go to 10-year-olds and 13-year-olds and teach them where they are completely fearless in learning. They just get into the, without even knowing what a computer is, they'll actually get in, learn CAD. You and I would say, I can't do it, I can't do it, you know, you step back. So you can actually change their life trajectory by a few degrees at 11 years old. By the time they're 20, they're at a very different place, and it doesn't cost much. So nowadays, uh, we're going to, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, I'm trying to run, do this for three, 250 schools. You know, I want to scale it back in, in, in India, too, now. So, yeah, this is actually from my own you know, life experience. Also, sir, like uh, do, uh, doing this, you are empowering students, but uh, your purpose also says creating entrepreneurs. Yeah. So educating them and... Uh, becoming entrepreneur is... I don't care if they don't become entrepreneurs. If they get to be become better employable, that is good. So now I'm actually looking for mentors. I want young graduates to go out and learn all these things and go out and teach. Okay? You can actually start making imp impact in your place. You've, you have already changed their life. You know, the becoming an entrepreneur's primary reason is that you can transform a community by introducing entrepreneurs. They create jobs, they create wealth, they solve problems. You know, so if you can create those entrepreneurs right in their society, in their community, that actually would change that. Okay. I think yeah. Last question. So. So I do not have a question for you, but I want to say something. So I'm one of those uh, one like entrepreneurs which you wanted to create in the last 10 years. So back in 2015, when I I was in my college, uh, so I was more focused towards uh, becoming a, like joining big firms like Microsoft, Google, and just earning a lot of money. But after attending your uh, event in uh, 2015, like a tech talk, uh, did change a lot of things for me. That so, was in Trivandrum, isn't it? Yeah, it was in Trivandrum. Uh, so after that, I realized, like, okay, there's more to uh, life than just earning money. So I'd like to thank you for your mission, like, uh, and uh, I hope you will continue it in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's all I have. Thank you so much. So if any of you want to be mentors, please contact me because I believe mentors are the catalyst in this transformation. You know, I've, I'd love to you know, get more of you.